we start to walk out after everyone's left. And a woman by the name of Rady Harris, who was a reporter, a columnist, a Hollywood columnist. She's kind of legendary. I don't know if she still works, but she had a, a cane. She had, a, you know, she had trouble walking. And that's why she was only halfway down the stairs when we came down, because she walked slow. Everyone else had left the theater. And we start to walk down, and she recognizes me, and she just looks up at me. This all sounds like a movie, but this is the truth. And nobody else is there, and I'm just kind of, I'm feeling strange. It's just a strange feeling. And she looks at me, and she says, you're the young man that uh, played that part. She points a finger. I remember she's got the cane. She's a little, a little itty, itty bitty woman, about four foot ten or something. I've seen her years later. I said, yeah. She says, she says, she says it'll never be the same for you. Life is never going to be the same for you. Just like, just like someone, you know. She says, it'll never be the same for you. From this moment on, your life has changed forever. <laughs> Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> and here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Jesus loves you more than you will know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stand up tall, Mrs. Robinson. The book had already been published. I read a review in the New York Times, and I thought, wow, this sounds like an interesting screenwriter, so possible screenwriter. So I read the book, and for whatever reason, I wasn't so keen on him as a screenwriter, but the book just stayed with me. I actually paid a thousand bucks against twenty. Not only that, the thousand bucks was out of my own pocket. And gulp, sob, choke, it got me right there because I didn't, I barely had it. But I believed in it and I wanted to get my hands on it. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was. Talented people are good the first time out. Mike Nichols, I hired him long before Virginia Woolf. He had done a single Broadway play, Barefoot in the Park, which I saw liked had sent in the book, not knowing him. I was in New York, got a message on my machine. Mr. Nichols called, likes the book. We met, decided to do it. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. Mike Nichols uh, asked me if I wanted to write a script. That simple. Gave me a book called The Graduate, and I said yes. Can I help you, sir? What? Oh, no. I'm just. Are you here for an affair, sir? I think we made six tests, uh, all with actors we admired, almost all of them with actors that we knew much better than Dustin. Actually, I think maybe I was the only person who'd seen Dustin perform on stage. And uh, it was clear from the test that Dustin was really interesting. Our dilemma was that we had conceived of that character, and in fact of all the major characters, as being prototypical Southern California, big, blonde people. Our fantasy casting when we were talking about it, when it was being written, was, um, you know, Bob Redford and Candy Bergen, uh, and uh, for mom and dad, Ronald Reagan and, uh, and um, Doris Day. All blonde, all healthy, all surfboards is what we called them. We wanted a family of surfboards. Uh, so here comes Dustin, clearly not a surfboard. Uh, so we immediately rationalized it. Uh, we were, they're genetic, he's a genetic throwback. Uh, Doris Day and Ronald Reagan have had this mutt.
we all were there for the readings, the screen tests, and we knew, well, I mean, we knew Dustin was the guy right away. But I saw him in a play called Harry Noon and Night, a Ronald Ribman play uh, at the American Place Theater. This must have been around 1963 or four. And he played, he played a crippled German transvestite. And it was impossible to believe that he wasn't at least one or two of those three things. It was a breathtaking bravura performance. In the book, Charles Webb says that the character is, uh, his name is Benjamin Braddock. Right away, I'm in trouble. Uh, he's like six feet tall or something. He's blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Says it right in the book. Head of the debating team, track star, wasp. And I just felt it was, a, you know, something was, I says, you know, you can't be that desperate. And I had heard that they had tested everybody. You know, I was just was like, and I still believe today that Catherine Ross and I, we were, it was like the bottom of the barrel. Say hello to Mrs. Robinson, Benjamin. Hello, Mrs. Robinson. Hello, Benjamin. Well, I had seen uh, her on Broadway and early television work, but on Broadway she did Two for the Seesaw, the role of Gittel, which couldn't have been funnier or sexier. What was your major subject at college? Art. Art? Oh, in that scene where she talks about when they're in bed together, she had a little vulnerability there, which was a wonderful addition. I guess you kind of lost interest in it over the years, then. Kind of. Early on, when Mrs. Like Robinson asked Ben to take her home uh, from the parents' party, the scene at her house, there's such funny, surreal sexual tension. Oh, my God. Pardon? Oh, no, Mrs. Robinson, oh, no. What's wrong? Mrs. Robinson, you didn't... I mean, you didn't expect... What? I mean, you didn't really think I'd do something like that. <laughs> like what? What do you think? <laughs> well, I don't know. He was sort of pinter married to, I don't know, Charlie Chaplin. I can't, I didn't, it just, uh, I was really struck by that. I like that thing that's funny yet serious. Basically, it's the core story about a guy having an affair with the mother of a girl that he falls in love with is so powerful that you know, you could give it to nine different writers and they'd come up with nine possibly interesting versions. Hey, Ben, Elaine's coming down from Berkeley soon. I want you to call her up this time. I will. Because I just think you two would hit it off real well together. Hello. Uh, not Hello. Doing your Catherine, uh, who was as strikingly beautiful as any girl who was in the business, and probably still is, um, that was no problem at all. I mean, Catherine was like the dream girl from across the street for anywhere in America. She really was gorgeous. I mean, she still is, but she was just, I remember the hair, and, and she had no makeup on, and she was this wisp of a, you know, it's like, you know, I couldn't look at her in the eye. I couldn't hide, you know. He said he thought we'd make a pretty good team. Oh, no, he said that. He said he thought we'd make a pretty good team. Oh, God. What's God. wrong with you? What is he, a student? A medical student. What year? Last. Well, uh, where did he propose to you? In his apartment. You went to his apartment with him? Yes. But you didn't, uh, you didn't, you know. Uh... No, I didn't spend the night. People have asked. How well did you know Catherine Ross? And unfortunately, I've always had to answer just enough to really admire her. Elaine, I like you. I like you so much. Do you believe that? Everyone told me that they fell in love with Elaine. Do you? Yes. I thought it's a good thing they don't really know me, you know? <laughs> 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 